Esoteric Life says, not gonna lie, I did not expect the text to be so passionate. I read it in a very passionate way, that's why. But uh, interesting thing, I, I, I learned that I believe from uh, Zoe Baker, Anarcho Pack, these, these texts very often end in such a fiery way, for example here, the right to well-being, well-being for all in all caps, because workers used to read them out, like as I'm doing with you actually, these, these, a lot of these texts were made to be read out loud and to be listened to by other people. Because very often, keep in mind, in the 20th, beginning 20th century, a lot of workers didn't know how to read. So they, they end up, very often end on like, like really revolutionary sentiments. And it, it's meant for the person at the end of reading it to like yell it at the top of his lungs and the, the workers all together go, yeah. All right, let, let's do it again, all right? But I want people in chat to, what is it called? Hypers? Hypers in chat? What we proclaim is the right to well-being. Well-being for all. Go crazy. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> there you go. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> yeah. Woohoo. So what I want to do here is um, talk about the Conquest of Bread. And the reason why I want to talk about the Conquest of Bread is because I'll be reading it. And I'll be reading it and I'll be commenting on it as I read um, and maybe discussing it with chat if they behave and if they're interesting. Um, <laughs> so if they behave, we'll talk about, uh, we'll discuss the Conquest of bread, bread with them. If they don't, I'll just share my thoughts on it. The reason why is because on my main channel, um, if you don't know my main channels, the, the Canvas Art History, even though it's not about art history anymore, we'll be talking about, um, I want to make a video, a companion piece to The Conquest of Bread so that when people read The Conquest of Bread, they might uh, follow chapter by chapter what, um, you know, my video summarizing every chapter. So that can help people when they're reading The Conquest of Bread, or it can just summarize and give the main ideas of the book to people who uh, might not have the time to read or just might not want to or can't. That's fine as well. So before we start that, um, oh, and by the way, I'll be commenting and I'll be I'll be interrupting my reading to, to give thoughts and opinions and ideas. And again, talk to to chat. Um, if you want to read, if you want to listen to this as an audiobook, there is um, the Audible Anarchist on YouTube. And the Conquest of Bread is there for you to listen. So without any interruptions or whatever. Uh, here it's more of a casual, let's hang out and let's read um, let's read the uh, Conquest of Bread together. And before we do, I want to look at the Wikipedia article, get a bit of, a, of, a, of an introduction on what the Conquest of Bread is, what it, how significant it is in anarchist thought, a bit of its history, its background, as it says here. Um, maybe we'll look into who Peter Kropotkin is just really, really quickly. And then we'll read the first chapter together. That's the uh, that's the uh, what we'll be doing today. All right, all right, let's go. Let's start. So the Conquest of Bread was originally written in French, by the way, because Kropotkin was um, was a uh, a Francophile. A lot of people in chat don't like French, um, mainly because uh, I think they don't like me, and my first language is French. Um, that's why here, instead of being Peter or Piotr, it's Pierre. Pierre Kropotkin, La Conquête du Pain, which means the conquest of, of bread. Pain here means bread in French. And also means, yeah, there you go. People in, people in chat being in pain as well. All right. The Conquest of Bread, also known colloquially as the Bread Book, is an 1892 book by the Russian anarcho-communist Peter Kropotkin. Originally written in French, it, was, it first appeared as a series of articles in the anarchist journal Le Révolté. It was first published in Paris with, with a preface by Élisée Reclus, who also suggested the title. Between 1892 and, 19, and 1894, it was serialized in part in the London journal Freedom, of which Kropotkin was a co-founder. In the work, Kropotkin points out what he considers to be the defects of the economic systems of feudalism and capitalism and why he believes they thrive they thrive on and maintain property, poverty and scarcity. He goes on to propose a more decentralized economic system based on mutual aid and voluntary cooperation, asserting that the tendencies for this kind of organization already exist both in evolution and in human society. The Conquest of Bread has become a classic of political anarchist literature. 
it was heavily influenced on both the Spanish Civil War and the, the Occupy movement. Everybody's following, aside from all the, the French haters in chat. I don't care about your input. If you don't, if you don't like French, I don't care about you. Oh, French is good because if you know French, you can teach P uh, French people how to speak a better language. Those are some harsh words. We'll, we'll get out of that topic. It's starting to hurt me. In 1886, Peter Kropotkin was released from French prison. All right, fuck the French. You're right, guys. Fuck the French. Why, is, why was he in French prison? Fearful of the anarchist scare that was gripping continental Europe following the assassination of Alexander II and wishing to focus more time on composing theory and arguing for his revolutionary ideals, Kropotkin moved to London in the same year. Following the death of Mikhail Bakunin in 1876, anarchists desired a prominent and respected theorist to explain their ideas and, after the splitting of the first international between Marxists and anarchists, Kropotkin wished to formally explain anarcho-communism in a way that would clearly differentiate the anarchists from the Marxists, but also help to correct what he saw as flaws in Bakunin's ideology of collectivist anarchism. With this aim, Kropotkin spent a, a great deal of time in London writing multiple books and pamphlets in between his international speaking tours to the United States and Canada. It was during this time of rapid literary output that Kropotkin wrote The Conquest of Bread, which became his most well-known attempt to systematically explain the essential parts of anarcho-communism. Kropotkin originally wrote the, the text in French and published in the French journal Le Révolté, where he served as the primary editor. Following its publication in France, Kropotkin published a, st a serialized version in English in the London anarchist journal Freedom. The book would later be collected and published as a book in France in 1892 and in England in 1906. The publication of the text was, watershed, uh, was a watershed moment in anarchist history since it was the first time that a, complete, a completed and in-depth theoretical work of anarcho-communist theory was available to the public. The publication of the text shifted the focus of anarchism from individualist, mutualist, and collectivist strains to social and communist tendencies. This shift would prove to be one of the most enduring changes in the history of anarchism as anarchism developed throughout the 20th century with Kropotkin and the conquest of bread as firm reference points. There you go. That's what we want to, that's what we're going to read. We're not going to read the, chat, the, the summaries because this is, we're about to read the, the book. Or at least the first chapter of the book for now. Um, but let's read the legacy. The Conquest of Bread had an impact far exceeding Kropotkin's own lifetime, playing a prominent role in the anarchist militias of the Spanish Civil War, as well as inspiring anarchist history, theory, and praxis throughout the 20th century. After the failure of Marxism-Leninism in the Soviet Union, some thinkers came to regard the book as prophetic, with Kropotkin anticipating the many pitfalls and human rights abuses that would occur given the centralization of industry. After the 2007 and 2008 financial crisis and the, subs the subsequent Occupy movement, Kropotkin's work took, an, uh, took on increased prominence. David Graeber, one of, the, uh, one of the intellectual leaders of the Occupy movement, cited Kropotkin directly as an inspiration for the, word, for the world the Occupy pro protesters were attempting to create. In 2015, David, David Priestland, written, writing for The Guardian, called for a renewed look at Kropotkin and the conquest of bread in the West, giving the recent collapse of the Soviet Union in, in 1991 and the global financial crisis of 2007 and 2008. Since 2018, a loose group of left-leaning YouTube content creators have collectively been referred to as BreadTube, inspired by the title of the book. The term breadpill, breadpilled refers to the act of becoming an anarcho-socialist, alluding to the red pill and blue pill from the Matrix. There you go. So this is, we're going to read just the, uh, the introduction to Peter Kropotkin, just to give you an idea of who this, this man is. This 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 handsome looking fella, yeah, Gibrano. That's actually where uh, bread two comes from. It's from this book. And also, first time in chat. Welcome. Glad to see your name in chat. I'm I'm surprised that a lot of people don't know don't know about this. Um, the fact that the bread book comes from an anarchist um, an anarchist book called The Conquest of Bread. In the video where I will summarize, I was thinking and it might be a, like a bad idea. I was thinking of, of doing it to make it a bit more lighter. I want to present the the book and my summary of it or my companion piece to it as like a cooking show where I actually make bread because I love making bread. I, I don't think I've ever talked about it in, on stream. 
but I absolutely love making bread. I think it's an, like, an incredible thing to do. It's very, it's very cheap. It's a bit time consuming, but it's worth it. You can eat from your own labor and it's, uh, it's definitely worth, to, uh, worth it making your bread if you have the time. It's, um, it's therapeutic. It's a lot of fun and it's, uh, I will frame the video as like a, a cooking show. I'm not doing anything fancy. I'm doing bread, which is really, really easy to do. So it might be a very long video summarizing Kropotkin's Conquest of Bread, but <laughs> how to make actual bread. It's a fun thing to do. And if you want to make bread, you can make batches of it and actually give it to, uh, to your neighbors. They'll be very happy. And it, you, you just knock at your neighbor's door and they'll be, who the fuck is that? You're like, hey, I'm your neighbor. I made a bit too much bread. I just freshly baked it. Here, have some. And they'll love you for it. Or maybe they'll, depending on where you are, they might not trust you. But they should. If you make good bread, for sure. <laughs> Godspeed says, I had a, a school trip to a supermarket where we made bread once. It's the only time I didn't mess up while cooking in my life. Lots of fun. It's hard to mess up bread. At least, I, I, I don't cook and I've never messed bread. Maybe once. But it's because I tried, like, I, I wasn't patient enough. But it's a lot of fun. It's very easy. And it feeds you, which is amazing for, for not a lot of, uh, for very cheap. It can feed a whole village for very cheap. Sean about to become a cottage core influencer. I could. Yeah. You know what? I'll, uh, I'll, uh, I'll look into it. How to become a, a, a an influencer, a cottage core influencer. I mean, I have the, I look like one, right? Which is good. I, if I'm about to make bread, I could stylize my video as a cottage core. Magna says, making bread seems so hard to make it good. Oh, listen, listen, just watch my video on, on the bread book and you'll know how to make delicious bread. My, my recipe, my, re, my secret recipe that I Googled is, is divine. Okay, les amis, on continue. On va continuer avec, le, avec uh, la lecture de, de Pierre Kropotkin. Pyotr Alexeyevich Kropotkin was a Russian anarchist and geographer known as a proponent of anarchist communism. Born into an aristocratic land-owning family, Kropotkin attended a military school and later served as an officer in Serbia, where he participated in several geological expeditions. He was imprisoned for his activism in 1874 and managed to escape two years later. He spent the next 41 years in exile in Switzerland, France, where he was imprisoned for almost four years, and England. While in exile, he gave lectures and published widely on anarchism and geography. Kropotkin returned to Russia after the Russian Revolution in 1917, but he was disappointed by the Bolshevik state. Kropotkin was a proponent of a decentralized communist society, free from, uh, from central govern government and based on voluntary associations of self-governing communities and worker-run enterprises. He wrote many books, pamphlets, and articles, the most prominent being The Conquest of Bread and Field Factories and Workshops, with Mutual Aid, a Factor of Evolution being his principal scientific offering. He contributed the article on anarchism to the uh, Encyclopedia, Encyclopedia Britannica 11th edition and left an unfinished work on anarchist ethical philosophy. That's all I wanted to do for, for, this, uh, for this introduction on Kropotkin. Chapter 1. Our Riches. Part 1. The human race has traveled far since those bygone ages when men used to fashion their rude implements of flint and lived on the precarious spoils of the chase, leaving to their children for their only heritage a shelter beneath the rocks, some poor utensils, and nature, vast, ununderstood, and terrific, with whom they had to fight for their wretched existence. During the agitated times which have elapsed since, and which have lasted for many thousand years, mankind has nevertheless amassed untold treasures. It has cleared the land, dried the marshes, pierced the forests, made roads. It has been building, inventing, observing, reasoning. It has created a complex machinery, wrested her secrets from nature, and finally it made a servant of steam. And the result is that now the child of the civilized man finds ready at its birth to his hand an immense capital accumulated by those who have gone before him. And this capital enables him to acquire merely by his own labor, combined with the labor of others, 
Riches surpassing the dreams of the Orient, expressed in the fairy tales of the Thousand and One Nights. The soil is cleared to a great extent, fit for the reception of the best seeds, ready to make a rich return for the skill and labor spent upon it, a return more than sufficient for all the wants of humanity. The methods of cultivation are known. On the wide prairies of America, each hundred men, with the aid of powerful machinery, can produce in a few months enough wheat to maintain 10,000 people for a whole year. And where man wishes to double his produce, to treble it, to multiply it a hundredfold, he makes the soil, gives to each plant the requisite, ca the re the requisite care, and thus obtains enormous returns. While the hunter of old had to scour 50 or 60 square miles to find food for his family, the civilized man supports his household with far less pains and far more certainty on a thousandth part of that space. Climate is no longer an obstacle. When the sun fails, man replaces it by artificial heat, and we see the coming of a time when artificial light also will be used to stimulate vegetation. Meanwhile, by the use of glass and hot water pipes, man renders a given space 10 and 50 times more productive than it was in its natural state. The prodigies accomplished in industry are still more striking. With the cooperation of those intelligent beings, modern machine, themselves the fruit of three or four generations of inventors mostly unknown, a hundred men manufacture now the stuff to clothe 10,000 persons for a period of two years. In well-managed coal mines, the labor of a hundred miners furnishes each year enough fuel to warm 10,000 families under an inclement sky. And we have lately witnessed twice the spectacle of a wonderful city springing up in a few months, I'll say it in French, at Paris, without interrupting in the slightest de degree the regular work of the French nation. And if in manufactures, as in agriculture, and as indeed through our whole social system, the labor, the discoveries, and the inventions of our ancestors profit chiefly the few, it is none the less certain that mankind in general, aided by the creatures of steel and iron which it already possesses, could already procure an existence of wealth and ease for every one of its members. Truly, we are rich, far richer than we think rich in what we already possess, richer still in the possibilities of production of our actual mechanical outfit, richest of all in what we might win from our soil, from our manufacturers, from our science, from our technical knowledge, were they but applied to bringing about the well-being of all. Isn't that beautiful? This this is uh, just a, a like an, um, a tribute to to modern technology. In, especially in um, in terms of uh, of um, of uh, production, both agricultural and industrial production, basically praising its praising its development um, in the sense that we he sees it as a legacy. He sees industrial and technological advancement as a legacy that is passed down from generation to generation. While technology wasn't really um, a thing or that important in human societies what humans were were given when they were born was basically just nature as he says but now we're given so much infrastructure that has been built on the toil of so many so, thousands if not hundreds of thousands millions of people before us all of this is like accumulated so that now we can we can profit from it as a collectivity but as he says we don't profit from these discoveries, from these the labor discoveries, inventions of our ancestors, all of those, which is a collection of millions of ancestors that all worked together to make these available to, for us to build upon. Well, they don't profit all of us for us to build upon, they profit a few. And that's gonna be his argument for the chapter. Sorry for the, uh, for the, uh, for the spoiler. But it's a really, really strong argument. Let's continue. Part two. We in civilized societies are rich. Why then are the many poor? Why this painful drudgery for the masses? 
Why even to the best paid workmen, this uncertainty for the morrow in the midst of all the wealth inherited from the past and in spite of the powerful means of production, which could ensure comfort to all in return for a few hours of daily toil. The socialists have said it and repeated it unwearyingly. Daily they reiterate it, demonstrating it by arguments taken from all the sciences. It is because all that is necessary for production, the land, the mines, the highways, machinery, food, shelter, education, knowledge, all have been seized by the few in the course of that long history of robbery, enforced migration and wars, of ignorance and oppression, which has been the life of the human race before it had learned to subdue the forces of nature. It is because taking advantage of alleged rights acquired in the past, these few appropriate today two-thirds of the products of human labor, and then squander them in the most stupid and shameful way. It is because, having reduced the masses to a point at which they have not the means of subsistence for a month or even for a week in advance, the few only allow the many to work on condition of themselves receiving the lion's share. It is because these few prevent the remainder of men from producing the things they need and force them to produce, not the necessaries of life for all, but whatever offers the greatest profits to the monopolists. And this is the substance of all socialism. Take indeed a civilized country. The forests which once covered it have been cleared, the marshes drained, the climate improved. It has been made habitable. The soil, which bore formerly only a coarse vegetation, is covered today with rich harvests. The rock walls in the valleys are laid out in terraces and covered with vines bearing golden fruit. The wild plants, which yielded not but acrid berries or uneatable roots, have been transformed by generations of culture into succulent vegetables or trees covered with delicious fruits. Thousands of highways and railroads furrow the earth and pierce the mountains. The shriek of the engine is heard in the wild gorges of the Alps, the Caucasus, and the Himalayas. Himalaya, Himalaya, Himalayas. The rivers have been made navigable. The coasts, carefully surveyed, are easy, are, are easy of access. Artificial harbors, laboriously dug out and protected against the fury of the sea, afford shelter to the ships. Deep shafts have been sunk into the rocks. Labyrinths of underground galleries have been dug out where coal may be raised or minerals extracted. At the crossings of the highways, great cities have sprung up, and within their borders all the treasures of industry, science, and art have been accumulated. Whole generations that lived and died in misery, oppressed and ill-treated by their masters and worn out by toil, have handed on this immense inheritance to our century. For thousands of years, millions of men have labored to clear the forests, to drain the marshes, and to open up highways by land and water. Every rood of soil we cultivate in Europe has been watered by the sweat of several races of men. Every acre has its story of enforced labor, of intolerable toil, of the people's suffering. Every mile of railway, every yard of tunnel, has received its share of human blood. The shafts of the mine still bear on their rocky walls the marks made by the pick of the workmen who toiled to excavate them. The space between each prop in the underground galleries might be marked as a miner's grave. And who can tell what each of these graves has cost, in tears, in privations, in unspeakable wretchedness to the family who dependent on the scanty wage of the worker, cut off in his prime by fire damp, rock wall, or flood? The cities, bound together by railroads and waterways, are organisms which have lived through centuries. Dig beneath them and you find, one above another, the foundations of streets, of houses, of theaters, of public buildings. Search into their history, and you will see how the civilization of the town, its industry, its special characteristics, have slowly grown and ripened through the cooperation of generations of its inhabitants before it could become what it is today. And even today, the value of each dwelling, factory, and warehouse, which has been created by the accumulated labor of the millions of workers, now dead and buried, is only maintained by the very presence and labor of legions of the men who now inhabit that special corner of the globe. 
Each of the atoms composing what we call the wealth of nations owe its value to the fact that it is a part of the great whole. What would a London dockyard or a great Paris warehouse be if they were not situated in these great centers of international commerce? What would become of our mines, our factories, our workshops, and our railways without the immense quantities of merchandise transported every day by sea and land? Millions of human beings have labored to create this civilization on which we pride ourselves today. Other millions scattered through the globe labor to maintain it. Without them, nothing would be left in 50 years but ruins. There is not even a thought or an invention which is not common property, born of the past and the present. Thousands of inventors, known and unknown, who have died in poverty, have cooperated in the invention of each of these machines which embody the genius of man. Thousands of writers, of poets, of scholars have labored to increase knowledge, to dissipate error, and to create that atmosphere of scientific thought without which the marvels of our century could never have appeared. And these thousands of philosophers, of poets, of scholars, of inventors have themselves been supported by the labor of past centuries. They have been upheld and nourished through life, both physically and mentally, by legions of workers and craftsmen of all sorts. They have drawn their motive force from the environment. The genius of a Seguin, a mayor, a grove, has certainly done more to launch industry in new directions than all the capitalists in the world. But men of genius are themselves the children of industry as well as of science. Not until thousands of steam engines ha had been working for years before all eyes, constantly transforming heat into dynamic force, and this force into sound, light, and electricity, could the insight of genius proclaim the mechanical origin and the unity of the physical forces. And if we, children of the 19th century, have at least grasped this idea, if we know now how to apply it, it is again because daily experience has prepared the way. The thinkers of the 18th century saw and declared it, but the idea remained undeveloped because the 18th century had not grown up like ours, side by side with the steam engine. Imagine the decades that might have passed while we remained in ignorance of this law, which has revolutionized modern industry had Watt not found a Soho skilled workman to embody his ideas in metal, bringing all the parts of his engine to perfection so that steam pent in a complete mechanism and rendered more docile than a horse, more manageable than, ho than water, became at last the very soul of modern industry. Every machine has had the same history, a long record of sleepless nights and of poverty, of disillusions and of joys, of partial improvements discovered by several generations of nameless workers, who have added to that original inventions these little nothings, without which the most fertile idea would remain fruitless. More than that, every new invention is a synthesis, the resultant of innumerable inventions which have preceded it in the vast field of mechanics and industry. Science and industry, knowledge and application, discovery and practical realization, leading to new discoveries, cunning of brain and of hand, toil of mind and muscle, all work together. Each discovery, each advance, each increase in the sum of human riches owes its being to the physical and mental travail of the past and the present. By what right, then, can anyone, whatever, appropriate the least morsel of this immense whole and say, this is mine, not yours. All right, how are we, how are we uh, hanging along? I really like the way Kropotkin is writing, but um, I really like the way he's putting it as well. How, how we live now is not a product of a few being managing everything really greatly or really well. Same for government. The way we are right now is because of thousands of, of years of improvement upon the improvements of pre uh, predecessors is the result of millions of people from from several generations all working together to bring the material conditions in which we are now everything is a product of millions of people collaborating together nothing can like nothing happens in a vacuum everything happens with the collaboration of other people whether it be the street that you know some people have built before you the house that some people have built before you, the, 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 all the, the, the water, like the reason you have water, the reason why you have electricity, the reason why you can, you can accomplish all these things 
is because millions of people worked towards not only the invention of, of aqueduct, not only the invention of electricity, but the invention of the, infra the infrastructure that happened, but also the building of the infrastructure that happened. All of those, it's all a, the, the resultant of millions of people cooperating globally for it to happen where you live. And what Kropotkin is saying, that all of this is the result of thousands, millions of people cooperating for centuries. And someone out there is going to say, hold on, this is mine. For example, take, take, uh, take the iPhone, which is the property of Apple, right? But the reason why the iPhone could even exist is because of prior, prior like inventions from not only the electricity to, you know, to, 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 to electronics, but those, those, those inventions rely on prior inventions, which can all be communicated, you know, to improve upon through the labor of millions. Not only millions today, but millions in the past. And all of this is this incredible collaborative effort is claimed by either one person or one entity. And to me, well, I feel like this is what Kropotkin is arguing against. He's saying this makes little, little sense. It's a lot of words. It's very wordy, but I feel like it's very um, inspirational. And I think he's using that inspiration to convey just how much just how much scope we often um, lose by by looking at work not in a historical perspective. He's looking at at technology, at at human society at, with a historical perspective. He's backing up and saying like all of this is cooperatively built, and it's not cooperatively built like a, a like a handful of guys together, or even just a couple like just one generation together. It's generations upon generations people who don't know each other, all working together, sometimes very often subconsciously. Right now, this stream is not a result of just me doing the labor of, of, of trying to, to read Kropotkin. It's also Kropotkin writing this, obviously, and me trying to interpret and read it for you. But also, the, the incredible, like all the, the technology that was made into this microphone, right? And this microphone, like the technology, was made by several people who built it. And these several people couldn't have built it if they did not have roads so that they could go to work and like collaborate together. And these roads couldn't have existed if there wasn't the thousands of people building these roads and these road networks. And these people wouldn't exist if, if, the, if you didn't have farmers and agricultural workers working to feed them. And these agricultural farmers also worked to feed whoever um, was making, were designing this microphone. And it's for every single little component or little part of these people who made these microphones couldn't have made these microphones without the prior knowledge of prior microphones that were also developed by other people, thousands of people probably, who, who could only develop a microphone if thousands of people um, supported their livelihood. So everything that we do relies so much on the cooperation of humanity that because it's such a, 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 a huge scope, we very often take it for granted or we, we lose sight of this, this cooperation because it's such a, an all, like an all encompassing. It's like, um, you know how, uh, a fish can't describe water cause they're, they're in water. Well, I feel like this is, this is, this is it. We're bathing so hard in the accomplishments and in the technical technical advancements and labor of millions of people that we don't see it. It's incredible to think about. And when you, and that's why Kropotkin is using so much words, so much fiery language to make us understand the scope and the, the emotional, um, it's almost, yeah, like I think he's trying to be emotional and how much people your existence relies on <laughs> and your, 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 your current conditions rely on how much work, sweat, tears, blood, blah, 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 that your existence right now, like relies on. And from that argument, which is not necessarily socialistic, right? Capitalists could, could also say, holy shit, isn't that crazy how capitalism 
forces us to work together in that in that in that way. Capitalists could say, "Hey, this is a good." I think I think that's what Heli, uh, Helitosis is, is saying, right? Capitalism is actually a type of socialism based, <laughs> but like, yeah, capitalism forces us to 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 cooperate together. Absolutely. It's it's of course it's it's um, it has it has it has its own um, its own issues and problems, but capitalism does force cooperation. Absolutely. Cri uh, critics of capitalism will will agree on that on that fact. But now, it's not it's not an, an attribute of capitalism. It's an attribute of hu like humanity. Humanity needs to cooperate. We've cooperated forever before even capitalism existed. Trust me. And that in cooperation, cooperation doesn't mean necessarily uh, consent. <laughs> By the way, F slaves cooperated with each other. They still they're still working with other people. They're just forced to work with other people. But that's still a form of. Um, of cooperation in let's say in a in a building humanity type of way so it's an argument that kropotkin is making that everyone can agree with monarchists can agree with capitalists can agree with socialists can agree with everyone can recognize that every part of our very being is the product of millions of people in a thousand in like thousands of generations that worked all together for this to be what it is today now his argument to become to make it become anarchist or at least communist is to say well because of that everything belongs to everyone how can someone one person say that this uh product which is the accumulation of thousands you know of all of our ancestors all of our common ancestors and claim it for yourself he's gonna say well that's maybe that's not the best way of of, of distributing wealth especially when you take in consideration that some people whose ancestors also you know bled and 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 you know sacrificed so much to make the world a better place well the world is a better place through the, all those sacrifices so perhaps you should benefit from from those sacrifices like from not from those sacrifices but from the the the, the development that in that that ensued from those sacrifices but capitalists won't have it that way what communists will say is let all of this technology in this development benefit everyone capitalists will say well it will benefit whoever owns it so he's using he's using that 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 universal feeling and that universal argument and turning it communist all right Let's continue. The last this is the last part. Last part of chapter 1. Part 3. It has come about, however, in the course of the ages traversed by the human race that all that enables man to produce and to increase his power of production has be has been seized by the few. Sometime perhaps we will relate how this came to pass. For the present, let it suffice to state the fact and analyze its consequences. Today, the soil, which actually owes its value to the needs of an ever-increasing population, belongs to a minority who prevent the people from cultivating it, or do not allow them to cultivate it according to modern methods. The mines, though they represent the labor of several generations and derive their sole value from the requirements of the industry of a nation and the density of the population, the mines also belong to the few, and these few restrict the output of coal and prevent it entirely if they find more profitable investments for their capital. Machinery, too, has become the exclusive property of the few, and even when a machine incontestably represents the improvements added to the original rough invention by three or four generations of workers, it nonetheless belongs to a few owners. And if the descendants of the very inventor who constructed the first machine for lace making a century ago were to present themselves today in a lace factory of Baal or Nottingham and demand their rights, they would be told, hands off, this machine is not yours, and they would be shot down if they attempted to take possession of it. Don't try to take a possession of a lace, of a lace making machine in uh, Baal or Nottingham. They'll fucking shoot you, apparently. 
The railways, which would be useless as so much old iron without the teeming population of Europe, its industry, its commerce, and its marts, belong to a few shareholders, ignorant perhaps of the whereabouts of the lines of rails which yield them revenues greater than those of medieval kings. And if the children of those who perished by thousands while excavating a railway cuttings and tunnels were to assemble one day, crowding in their rags and hunger to demand bread from the shareholders, they would be met with bayonets and grape shot to disperse them and safeguard vested interests. In virtue of this monstrous system, the son of the worker on entering life finds no field which he may till, no machine which he may tend, no mine in which he may dig, without accepting to leave a, a great part of what he will produce to a master. He must sell his labor for a scant and uncertain wage. His father and his grandfather have toiled to drain this field, to build this mill, to perfect this machine. They gave to the work the full measure of their strength, and what more could they give? But their heir comes into the world poorer than the lowest savage. All right. If he obtains leave to till the fields, it is on condition of surrendering a quarter of the produce of his master, and another quarter to the government and middlemen. And this tax levied upon him by the state, the capitalist, the lord of the manor, and the middleman is always increasing. It rarely leaves him the power to improve his system of culture. If he turns to industry, he is allowed to work, though not always even that, only on condition that he yield a half or two-thirds of the product to him whom the land recognizes as the owner of the machine. Um, just, to, just to explain this, just really, really quickly... You, you've seen, you might have seen these memes online. The whole idea that someone working makes a thousand, um, you make candles, right? Here's a candle. I don't know why it's on. Uh, I think Bali just gave me these candles. So you have this candle. You probably can't see where I'm just a little short, a little small square. You have this candle. You work on a factory line and you, you're paid almost nothing. And you're like, I need to work half an hour just to pay one of these, yet I produce maybe a hundred an hour, right? Or so 50 for every 30 minutes, but I can only afford one if I pay, if I work 30 minutes. That's what he means here by saying that you don't, um, you're not paid how much you labor to make something. It's a very basic example though. Anyway, let's continue. We cry shame on the feudal baron who forbade the peasant to turn a clod of earth unless he surrendered to his lord a fourth of his crop. We call those the barbarous times. But if the forms have changed, the relations have remained the same, and the worker is forced, under the name of free contract, to accept feudal obligations. For, turn where we will, he can find no better conditions. Everything has become private property, and he must accept or die of hunger. The result of this state of things is that all of our production tends in a wrong direction. Enterprise takes no thought for the needs of the community. Its only aim is to increase the gains of the speculator. Hence the constant fluctuations of trade, the periodical industrial crises, each of which throws scores of thousands of workers on the streets. The working people cannot purchase with their wages the wealth which they have produced, and industry seeks foreign markets among the money classes of other nations. In the East, in Africa, everywhere, in Egypt, Tonkin, or the Congo, the European is thus bound to promote the growth of serfdom. And so he does. But soon he finds everywhere similar competitors. All the nations evolve on the same lines, and wars, perpetual wars, break out for the right of precedence in the market. Wars for the possession of the East, wars for the empire of the sea, wars to impose duties on imports and to dictate conditions to neighboring states, wars against those blacks who revolt. The roar of the cannon never ceases in the world. Whole races are massacred. The states of Europe spend a third of their budgets in armaments, and we know how heavily these taxes fall on the workers. Education still remains the privilege of a small minority, for it is idle to talk of education when the workman's child is forced at the age of 13 to go down into the mine or to help his father on the farm. It is idle to talk of studies to the worker who comes home in the evening crushed by the excessive toil with its brutalizing atmosphere. 
Society is thus bound to remain divided into two hostile camps, and in such conditions, freedom is a vain word. The radical begins by demanding a greater extension of political rights, but he soon sees that the breath of liberty leads to the uplifting of the proletariat, and then he turns around, changes his opinions, and reverts to repressive legislation and government by the sword. A vast array of courts, judges, executioners, policemen, and gallers is needed to uphold these privileges, and this array gives rise in its turn to a whole system of espionage, of false witness, of spies, of threats, and corruption. The system under which we live checks in its turn the growth of the social sentiment. We all know that without uprightness, Without self-respect, without sympathy and mutual aid, humankind must perish, and perish the few races of animals living by rapine, or the slave-keeping ants. Rapine? Rapine? I don't know. But such ideas are not to the taste of the ruling classes, and they have elaborated a whole system of pseudoscience to teach the contrary. Fine sermons have been preached on the text that those who have should share with those who have not. But he who would act out this principle is speedily informed that these beautiful sentiments are all very well in poetry, but not in practice. To lie is to degrade and besmirch oneself, we say, and yet all civilized life becomes one huge lie. We accustom ourselves and our children to hypocrisy, to the practice of a double-faced morality, and since the brain is ill at ease among lies, we cheat ourselves with sophistry. Hypocrisy and sophistry become the second nature of the civilized man. But a society cannot live thus. It must return to truth or cease to exist. Thus, the consequences which spring from the original act of monopoly spread through the whole of social life. Under pain of death, human societies are forced to return to first principles. The means of production being the collective work of humanity, the product should be the collective property of the race. Individual appropriation is neither just nor serviceable. All belongs to all. All things are for all men, since all men have need of them, since all men have worked in the measure of their strength to produce them, and since it is not possible to evaluate everyone's part in the production of the world's wealth. All things are for all. Here is an immense stock of tools and implements. Here are all those iron slaves which we call machines, which saw and plane, spin and weave for us, unmaking and remaking, working up raw matter to produce the marvels of our time. But nobody has the right to seize a single one of these machines and say, this is mine. If you want to use it, you must pay me a tax on each of your products any more than the feudal lord of medieval times had the right to say to the peasant, this hill, this meadow belongs to me, and you must pay me a tax on every sheaf of corn you reap, sheaf of corn you reap, on every rick you build. All is for all. If the man and the woman bear their fair share of work, they have a right to their fair share of all that is produced by all, and that share is enough to secure them well-being. No more of such vague formulas as the right to work or the each the whole result of his labor. What we proclaim is the right to well-being, well-being for all. Well-being for all will be the chapter of uh, chapter two, which will be the chapter that we'll read probably next stream. Um, but yeah, what do you think of chapter one? Isn't this beautiful? Temer tells me what a goaler is. A goaler is British spelling of jailers. There you go. It took me a, a long time to learn this too. <laughs> First principles gave me flashbacks to end cap arguments. Interesting, right? That's the interesting part. Um, Kropotkin sees first principles as, because uh, he, he was really into evolution. He wrote mutual aid, a factor of evolution, which we might look into in the future. Um, I'm still young, so I, I have a lot of books to look into um, and make it, turn them into content, I guess. And the first principles of humanity, at least to, to Kropotkin, isn't individualism, like rugged individualism, where one against all, uh, one against each other, as uh, some end caps would say. To Kropotkin, the, the um, first principles are working together and sustaining each other because... Uh, first principles of, of humanity is I give you the fruits of my labor 
to my community because my community's fruits of labor also benefit me. So we all, we don't necessarily calculate how much I'm contributing to my community in order to see how much I'm allowed to, to have from the community. It's a, it's a mutually beneficial thing for everyone. It's a, it's sharing, it's loving, it's, Esoteric Life says, not gonna lie, I did not expect the text to be so passionate. I read it in a very passionate way, that's why. But uh, interesting thing, I, I, I learned that, I believe, from uh, Zoe Baker, Anarchopack, that um, these these texts very often were, and, and in such a fiery, fiery way, for example, here, the right to well-being, well-being for all, in all caps, because... Workers used to read them out like as I'm doing with you actually these these a lot of these texts were made to be read out loud and to be listened to by other people because very often keep in mind in the 20th beginning 20th century a lot of workers didn't know how to read they didn't need to uh, necessarily uh, at least to survive and to work and they were just weren't taught how to read um, they didn't have the time they were they were working in factories in, in miserable conditions. So Kropotkin knew that, a lot of anarchist thinkers knew that. So when they wrote, they wrote knowing that these texts will be heard by a lot of people. So they, they end up in a, in, they very often end on like, like really revolutionary sentiments. Uh, the, the Communist Manifesto like ends with the uh, uh, workers of the world unite, you have nothing to lose but your chains. And it, it's meant for the person at the end of reading it to like yell it at the top of his lungs and the, the workers all together go, yeah. I didn't, I didn't do a, a all right, let, let's do it again, all right? But I want people in chat to, what is it called, hypers? Hypers in chat? <laughs> the 10 people in chat who are listening to someone read uh, The Congress of Bread by Kropotkin <laughs> on a Thursday afternoon are all gonna go, yeah, when I go, what we proclaim is the right to well-being, well-being for all. And then the crowd goes wild. All the industrial workers who don't know how to read go crazy. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> there you go. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> yeah. Woohoo. But it's an interesting, uh, like, uh, it, it, it makes you read this, at least the endings of, of each chapter in a very different light, understanding who are there, like who the audience of these, of these, of these are for, right? Or who these audiences are. But yeah, no, I'm, uh, it's, it's, it's easy to believe that all theory is just a very, um, especially like, for example, the bread book, which is known to be, you know, like a, like, oh, it's, it's theory, right? It's like one of the main books of theory for anarcho uh, anarcho communism. It's easy to think that, oh, it's going to be really long. And it does at one point become very long because like Kropotkin goes into numbers and stuff like that. This is, of course, the first chapter. So maybe it is more uh, like uh, passionate than uh, than the rest of the book to, to hook the, the the reader. But nonetheless, you know, it, it's it can still be uh, it's still very passionate, even though it's 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 technically theory <laughs> the next manifesto should end with poggers yeah 